All right. Well, we read a similar passage this morning. We're going to go ahead and read uh, the passage we'll be, uh, I'll be preaching on this morning, Luke 5, 33 through 39. And just a note on those questions for Sunday school, uh, we are asking that you email them in advance. <laughs> I do reserve the right to punt on any question, at least for a week, so that I can get a head start. But uh, definitely email, email those in. That, that, Pastor Carl and I look at that event with, with a smile. It's a, it's a great, fun challenge and can lead to some great discussions and meeting people's needs where they're at. So please email those this week. Okay, let's look at Luke chapter 5, verses 33 through 39. And I've still got my old New American Standard, so it's going to be slightly different from the ESV. But here we go. Luke chapter 5, verses 33 through 39. And they said to him, the disciples of John often fast and offer prayers. The disciples of the Pharisees also do the same. But yours eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, you cannot make the attendants of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them, can you? But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. And he was also telling them a parable. No one tears a piece of cloth from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. Otherwise, he will both tear the new and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins and it will be spilled out and the skins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. And no one, after drinking old wine, wishes for new for he says, the old is good enough. Lord, we pray once more as we come into your word, and we thank you for its power in our lives. We thank you for its unchanging truth and its enduring value. We thank you that it causes us to grow spiritually. Lord, we thank you especially for the words of Christ deposited there. We pray that you would teach us from them this morning and that your spirit would give us understanding. And Lord, I pray for his help to speak as I ought to speak. Thank you for building us up in our faith this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this title for this morning's message is Behold, the New Has Come. Behold, the New Has Come. We left off last week in the middle of this scene here in Luke chapter 5. Jesus is in Matthew's house and is feasting with his friends. He's called Levi in this passage. It's Matthew Levi who would become the apostle Matthew. And he had been a Jewish tax collector for Rome. As such, he had grown rich among his community of Jews who were themselves relatively impoverished. And he did so at their expense. His past life was marked by selfish ambition, by greed, by deceit and even treason. And all of this was very public day in and day out. His reputation around Capernaum would have revolved around these things. And we can safely assume that he was thoroughly despised and for good reason. But by his mercy, in this passage, the Savior seeks him and calls him and compels him to faith, shows him compassion and forgives him. And this is just an amazing scene. And it's more amazing that Matthew does instinctively what anyone does when they experience and encounter glory and wonder, and that is they rush to tell their friends about it. And this is the heart of the best kind of evangelism. Matthew has no great commission yet to obey, but he wants to beckon others to come encounter the same wonderful Savior that he has. And so he throws a party. And so here's Jesus, the sinless son of God. From his infancy through his childhood and young adult life, no sin. He had been confronted by the devil in the wilderness for 40 days and yet without sin. He will be hated and despised and rejected by his people. He will be mocked by his own family. He will be slandered, falsely accused, unjustly tried, sentenced to death and yet without sin. Jesus never sinned. All of that he endures 
for sinners like you and me and Matthew and his friends in order for them to be forgiven. Don't ever think that somehow your sin is too great for the grace of God. This is what Jesus came to address. He came to seek and to save the lost. He came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. In Romans 5.20, Paul says the law came in so that transgression, transgression would increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. And that's on display in this scene. Sitting and feasting among these sinners, Jesus is confronted by the self-righteous Pharisees and their scribes. Look at verse 30. The Pharisees and scribes began grumbling at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered and said to them, It is not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. To them and their sensibilities, this social interaction and seemingly relational harmony would have defiled Jesus. In the very least, it would have discredited him as a legitimate rabbi. But their perspective on this scene and his perspective are totally at odds. He responds in verse 31, It is not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. This is the heart of the gospel message. This is the core of Christianity, that Jesus came, initiated for us. He came seeking us, even in our condemned state before God, in our helpless, sick, spiritual state before God. He didn't wait for us to get better. He didn't come to save those who started on their own to get better or added a measure of self-reform, he came to us in that state. He does the saving. He does the rescuing. We don't. We can't. We are dead in sins and transgressions, and dead people don't do anything. But by his grace, he makes us alive, Paul says in Ephesians 2. Romans 5, 6 says, For while we were still helpless, helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And in Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This whole notion and this scene, this seeking out of sinners, it reflects the very heart of God. His love is like this, to see us in our condition as we are, condemned guilty, suffering and sick, undeserving of his even attention, and yet he comes after us. He goes after us like a shepherd seeking a lost sheep, like a father looking for a lost child. This is God's nature. This is good news for the world. And Jesus reveals this truth at this scene in Matthew's house, and the Pharisees don't get it. And the scene then shifts to a minor tone. And this difference between the way Jesus is looking at this scene and they're, the way they're looking at the scene are drastically different, and that's what he goes on to address. In essence here, in the rest of this passage, verses 33 through 39, Jesus' response demonstrates that his presence in Israel has far-reaching implications, that things are about to change, that things are changing, and he describes this difference, this gap, and this change with two related comparisons. Notice how the scene shifts abruptly in verse 33. And they said to him, the disciples of John often fast and offer prayers. The disciples of the Pharisees also do the same, but yours eat and drink. Now, just notice a couple details. The, it begins with, and they, and they said to him, now, the nearest antecedent to that is the scribes and Pharisees. Who are the they? From verse 30, the scribes and Pharisees began grumbling, saying, verse 33, and they said to him. Now, in Matthew's gospel, and Mark's gospel, it's slightly different. In Mark 2.18, it says, John's disciples, that's John the Baptist, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And they came and said to him, why do John's disciples 
and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast. All right? So they are the source of the question. Seems to be John's disciples. Same thing in Matthew's gospel. So how do we clarify this? Well, I think the best way to understand it is that the question specifically came from the disciples of John who lived in this area of Capernaum. And they were there uh, and, and part of the crowds around this scene. But it's also possible that this is posed on an actual day when the Pharisees were fasting. If you remember from later in Luke's gospel, in Luke 18, Jesus illustrates the difference between someone who is genuinely repented before God and thus forgiven versus a self-righteous Pharisee. He crafts the portrait of a typical Pharisee. And one of the tokens of their self-righteousness is that they say, I fast twice a week. And we do have evidence outside of the New Testament that indeed this was an established custom of the Pharisees. In fact, not only do they have that as the standard for their practice, twice a week we fast, but it was specified on which days that would be, Monday and Thursday. I'm not sure why. If you're looking for a source on that, the Didache, one of the early, earliest Christian writings outside the New Testament, mentions that in chapter 8, verse 1. Jesus also describes their practice of fasting in Matthew 6, 16. Teaching his disciples, he says, whenever you fast, don't be like them. Do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites, for they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. Monday would come, Thursday would come, they would fast, everyone would know it. They would seek to look more famished and gaunt in order to impress those who were not Pharisees. Jesus taught his disciples to fast in a different way. This may have been one of those days and thus prompted the question. They see at Matthew's house this great feast. They smell the aroma of a great feast. And if on that day you're fasting, you get kind of grumpy. And so they pose this question and it turns the scene around. The most important thing about this question is not who it came from, but rather the logic of the question. Jesus is in the midst of feasting on this day, celebrating with Matthew and his friends. The Pharisees very likely could have been one of their days of fasting. Notice the logic. John's disciples often fast and offer prayers. The disciples of the Pharisees also do the same but yours eat and drink. There's three groups there. And what they're doing is they're pointing to, the logic points to the common ground between the Pharisees and John's disciples. Now, if you remember from earlier in, in, in John the Baptist's ministry, there was not a lot of whole common ground between them. Remember when they came to John to be baptized by him? sort of an affirmation of his ministry in Matthew 3, 7. It says, when John saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And he basically tells them, unless you repent, just like anyone else, you stand condemned. I don't think the Pharisees would have liked that very much. And yet on this issue of fasting, they have an agreement. And that's important part of the logic. We fast, they fast, and we're so different, but we get this right, and you guys, you don't even fast. You're not even fasting. In essence, I think this is a charge to Jesus as being inconsistent and really an amateur. In other words, Jesus, you can't really be much because you didn't get the memo on fasting. We fast, and even John's disciples fast. And there were so different, and though even though we're so different, at least we got that right. But look at you, you're way out in left field, and you must be stuck on basics. And I think that logic prompts what Jesus says in the rest of the passage. He wants to correct their misunderstanding. They're seeing themselves as superior, him inferior. And he wants to know that, yes, there is a difference, but the difference has to do with eternally significant reasons. My disciples feast and rejoice now. 
because I, the king, the bridegroom, is here. The Messiah is here. Behold, the new has come, and now is a time to celebrate. And in order to explain that to them and show them that, he relates two comparisons, or he conveys two comparisons that are related. The first one is fasting versus feasting, and the second one is old versus new. Fasting versus feasting in verses 34 through 35, and then old versus new in 36 through 39. Look at verse 34. This is the first metaphor or word picture. And Jesus said to them, can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. This then is about the who and the when of his explanation. The bridegroom is the who, and he is here. And these days are now, and answer the when. He is here now. But he adds that will not always be the case. There are two layers to consider in this metaphor. The first is the metaphor of the bridegroom, or the simple metaphor of the bridegroom. It is couched here in the Lord's words as a rhetorical question, which means it has an obvious answer and really reflects a statement. You cannot make the, the attendance of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them, can you? Obvious answer, no, you can't. And this is actually insightful and sort of cunning of the Lord because in light of those, that pharisaical practice of Monday fast, Thursday fast, if you happen to be a Pharisee and one of your friends was a new groom, that wedding would last several days or up to a week. And you were excused from the fast on that week so that you can feast. So this is very pointed to them. And it's a simple metaphor. The, the obvious answer here is, of course not. When it is appropriate to celebrate and feast, even the Pharisees will celebrate and feast, namely at a wedding. And that's what time it is. If you think about it, what even the Pharisees and most Jews would have been fasting for and praying for was the coming of the Messiah. Maybe their biggest, highest hope. And now he is here. And so there is a change. There is a shift in what is appropriate. Now that pertains broadly to Israel. The time is now for celebrating and feasting. It pertains broadly to Israel. This is the time now. But also, keep in mind, very narrowly for those seated in that house, right? This small sort of bunch of tax collectors and sinners in that house represent sort of a first fruit, right? A, a small harvest out of Israel of those who can celebrate, and that's what they're doing. But on top of this, this bridegroom is a messianic title. And so when the Lord conveys this, it is a simple metaphor that they can understand, but also it is a significant title for the Messiah. And the New Testament goes on to amplify this title of Christ in various passages. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23, the passage about, the, the most extensive passage about how Christian husbands should love their wives. The, the epitome of that is Christ as the great husband of his church. And then we read this morning from Revelation in chapter 19, verses 7 through 9, about the future marriage supper of the Lamb, really the culmination of history when Christ returns and receives the church to himself. But even John the Baptist referred to Christ in this way. If you want, turn in your Bibles to John chapter 3. And really here, John, with this tremendous insight into the role of Messiah, refers to him this way. We can pick up in John 3, 28. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. Then again, this metaphor, he who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, referring to himself, who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase, but I must decrease. And so as the Lord conveys this title, it's very similar to 
the last scene where he describes himself as the Son of Man. As the Messiah, he is the long-anticipated Son of Man from the book of Daniel. But he is also the long-anticipated Bridegroom, another title referring to his identity as Messiah. One more passage I think that's significant. If you remember very recently in Christ's ministry, back in Luke chapter 4, when Jesus was in Nazareth, he got up in the synagogue, as was his custom, to read. And he chose a specific passage from the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 61, 1 through 2. That's back in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 through 19. It says, in the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he, as he proceeds in his ministry in Galilee, he demonstrates that to be at work. His actions follow through with his very brief sermon when he says, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. I want you to turn back to Isaiah 61. It's toward the end of the book. And just notice how that passage continues. It talks about the restoration of Israel. It talks in verse 18 about making an everlasting covenant with them, about regathering his people. But then in verse 10, it says, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exult in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as a garden causes things to sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. And this is what Jesus came to do. This is what he has done and is doing in this scene. He has wrapped Matthew and his believing friends in a robe of righteousness. He is causing righteousness and praise to spring up here in Israel before all the nations. This little band of outcasts in this house is one example. It is a harvest of praise to God for his forgiveness. And the point is the bridegroom is here. And he is doing what Messiah came to do. Would it be now appropriate for feasting or fasting? And Jesus' answer is obvious. It's time to celebrate because the king, the Messiah, the bridegroom is here. I want to ask a question for us this morning. What about us and what about now? Now do we fast or do we feast as his followers? Do we sorrow or do we celebrate? Notice the detail added in verse 35. It says, the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. In other words, yes, feasting now, celebrating now, but it's temporary. What does he mean by being taken away? Well, one view says that this refers only to the three days of him in the grave. The cross and, the, and his death, are where he's taken away, but then after his resurrection, he's there again, and even in his ascension, in the coming of the Holy Spirit, his presence is with his disciples always. I think this is true in a sense. John 16, verses 19 through 20, I think Jesus taught this very thing. He said to his disciples, a little while, and you will not see me, and again, a little while, and you will see me. They asked, what does he mean by that? He says, truly, truly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned into joy. Verse 22, therefore, you too have grief now, but I will see you again and your heart will rejoice. And I think he's talking about that brief interlude before his resurrection. 
But here in this verse, verse 35, I think he refers to his time away from the world at his father's right hand after his ascension. That is where Christ is now, seated at the right hand of God in heaven. Theologians call this his session. And we are waiting for his final return in his second coming. Now, here's why I think that's what he means. Notice the metaphor again. This is not just a picture of the bridegroom leaving or just a picture of Jesus going away from his disciples, but of a bridegroom being passively taken away from them. And in the near context, them refers to literally the, the wedding guests in the ESV, literally the sons of the bride chamber, which would have been his attendants at, at the wedding, his friends for that entire week. The bridegroom is taken away passively from them. This is the more specific picture of a, of a groom getting hauled out of his own wedding. Uh, Daryl uh, 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 Bach in his excellent commentary writes this. This reference is one of the first hints of Jesus' approaching death. The picture is grim. A man is removed from the scene of his own wedding. That, that's not normal, right? A groom doesn't get up and say, well, you know, I've got to go catch the game. I'll be back, right? He's not going anywhere during his wedding. And so that passive nature of the verb, I think, is really important. He is taken away, not by his own will. The implication then in the scene is that of an interruption, that the culmination of the wedding is suspended until further notice. And when something like that happens in normal life, what needs to be done? You got to reschedule, right? It's not, it's not finished yet. It's not complete yet. And I believe we find the completion and culmination of this wedding of the bridegroom in Revelation 19 at the end. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready. Even in Ephesians 5, when Paul is talking about Christ as the husband of the church, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's past that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. When we hear that sort of intended result of Christ's work for the church, it's yet future. He's doing that work in us now in every believer's life, so that collectively, when we reach glory, we are holy and unblemished, and we will be presented to him at that future marriage, spotless and pure and clean and holy in his sight. But it is yet future. And so the time he is taken away, I believe, refers to this intervening time now. There was a difference when Jesus was here and walked among us. He is here in the sense that he is God and is omnipresent as he has always been God, has always been omnipresent in that sense. He is here in the, in, in the sense of his indwelling Holy Spirit, which every believer has. It makes an absolute difference in our lives to bear the fruit of his character, to understand his word by the Spirit, because we have the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2. That is cl uh, clear. And yet there is yet a difference we do not yet see him face to face, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. We look through a glass dimly. And so the question again, do we feast or do we fast as Christians? Do we sorrow now or do we celebrate as believers today? And I believe the answer is both. It's both. 2 Corinthians 6, 8, Paul talking about his apostleship. We apostles are treated as imposters and yet are true, as unknown and yet well-known, as dying, and behold, we live. Paul sees these two dynamics at work in his own life and ministry all the time. And then he says, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing. What was the Apostle Paul like? Pressed down, distressed, tired, fatigued, sick, injured, infirmed, cold, naked, in peril, homeless, and yet at the same time, 
clothed, well fed, alive, sorrowful yet always rejoicing. He says, poor yet making many rich, having nothing yet possessing everything. Again, in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, so we do not lose heart, Paul says, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day, every day, for this light momentary affliction, the sorrow part is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, and that's the celebrating part. There is exaltation in Christ now and exasperation every day. There is glorying in Christ in the cross now, and there is groaning in this fallen world. Romans 8, 22, for the whole creation has been groaning together in pains of childbirth until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, Paul says, who have the first fruits of the Spirit. For Paul, that is celebrate. We who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we await eagerly for the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies, speaking very much of our physical bodies that are wasting away, that are um, uh, uh, sorrowful, that are dying, and yet inwardly rejoicing. But there is groaning for the Christian. There is groaning. There is groaning. There is groaning. It's all around us. Everybody experiences it. Nobody is exempt. Sometimes when we have a very pointed trial and a pointed time of suffering, I think it's so heavy and so specific, it seems that we, we begin to think because others don't have that same specific suffering, that their lives are in a different sort of perfect standard than ours. And why isn't God allowing us the same? Why am I being singled out to have to go through this? But beloved, that is not the case. That is not the situation. We are all as creatures under this fallen world. And if there's any specific and pointed thing that Jesus does when he's here in the Gospels, is to single out people to redeem them from that, to heal them, right, in their suffering, and to grant them grace and forgiveness. He's doing those same things today, but it is not, it is not without us experiencing this groaning. It's both. And so there is need for fasting, and there is need for feasting in the Christian life. There is need for glorying, and there is need for groaning. And our worship should reflect this. On Sundays, we should have an abundance of celebration for what Jesus has already done and accomplished and is doing in our lives. And there is also a time for longing for his return because of the suffering that we experience. We sorrow deeply as Christians, but we sorrow with hope. In either way, in either way, Christ should be the center. Right? We groan with hope. We sorrow with hope. And we celebrate because of what he's done. So the first comparison is here. Fasting versus feasting. When he's there with his disciples, it is feasting. And yet while we wait now, it is both a fasting and a feasting. The second comparison he goes on to describe is the old versus the new. He amplifies his point. As he, as he goes through this, this again is meant to demonstrate to the Pharisees the vast difference between what he's doing in that house with Matthew and his friends and his perspective versus theirs, and he extends the teaching to correct that misunderstanding. Two truths, two main truths he brings here, and they're couched in three parables. So if you have your outline, I don't want you to get too, I had a hard time with this, two main truths. So the main truths undo the parables, but then there are three distinct parables. The first two go with the first truth, and the third goes with the second truth. So a little asymmetry there. Two main truths. The first is this, the old and the new are incompatible. As Jesus compares and introduces this structure of old and new, the first truth he wants them to know is the old and the new are incompatible. Now, there's an undercurrent, I think, in their interaction that would draw Jesus to do what they do. There's this sort of, there's this always this magnetism to legalism and self-righteousness and sort of 
works-based righteousness. The disciples of John often fast and offer prayers. The Pharisees do the same. We're doing all this fasting. You don't do either one. I think from their perspective, there's this undercurrent of, we're going to call you out on this and try to almost shame you a little bit publicly so that you'll start to do it as well. There's this sort of draw here. And part of Jesus' response is, that is old, and what I'm doing is new, and I can't, I, it's not compatible. I can't do what you're asking me to do. What I bring, all that I represent is new and is not compatible with you or what you represent. I cannot merge the two together. There is no commonality. Jesus is not just another rabbi or another sect of Judaism. There were all kinds during that time. He represents another way entirely, a new way, and it cannot be melded to the old. Now, this same truth comes in the first two parables. Look at the first in verse 36, the old and the new garment. Verse 36, he told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. This is just a very wonderful, simple, straightforward illustration. I love the picture. It's kind of like this. I've got some old jeans, or better yet, an old flannel. I used to have one that I'd wear while I studied and typed, and my, I have the t terrible posture when I type, so my elbows rub on the desk. And eventually it wore these big holes in the, in the elbows. Some of you have seen my sweater similar. So my solution is I go up to L.L. Bean and buy a brand new expensive flannel shirt. I buy one, I bring it home, and I cut holes in the elbows, right? Bigger than my holes in, in the other one. I, I, I cut new material out of the elbow of the flannel shirt. It doesn't have to come from the elbow, by the way. <laughs> and the plaid doesn't match, but if I get it out of the elbow, I can line up sort of the lines so that it's at least parallel. And then I go sewing them on. You know, at this point, I'm picturing like a Mr. Bean episode, right? <laughs> sewing these patches on. And I've got this custom shirt now, an old shirt that I love, patched up and repaired. And I go back to working. But after a couple weeks, as you know, because that new fabric is strong and has not been washed 100 times and worn through, by my, my, my movements and everything, that the, 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 the fabric on the side of the old shirt is just as weak as where the holes were. And so the stitches of the new patch begin to rip through and I'm back to holes in my elbows. And I finally come to my senses, of course, and realize, okay, I don't have one good shirt anymore. I now have two bad ones. <laughs> and one of them was brand new and very expensive and I didn't even use it. I ruined it to try and resurrect the old one. I would have been far better off just to buy the new shirt and leave the old behind. That's Jesus' point, right? It would have been far better off just to buy the new shirt and to leave the old behind. That's the logic of this first truth. The old and the new are incompatible. They cannot be melded. If they are if there is an attempt to meld the two, both will end up worse. The new will be damaged. The old won't be fixed anyways. Jesus saying, I am interested in bringing what is new as completely new. There will be no lasting value in trying to make my teaching work to correct yours. In the end, both will be worse off. Which brings up the question, what is the old and what then is the new? Such a crucial question for this passage. The old, I think, is pretty clear. It represents Judaism. Now, what I don't mean is a kind of faith-based biblical Judaism that coursed throughout redemptive history. The faith of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, David, Josiah, the prophets, and others. It's more specific than that. The Pharisaic tradition was probably the most prominent and influential tradition at this time in Judaism. Everything at the temple was corrupted by the Sadducees and the priests. The Pharisees were extremely influential. And they had developed during the old uh, intertestamental period, 
And their mode was basically to add a layer of pharisaical oral tradition to the law of God in order to create a, quote, hedge around the law. That's the specific terms used in the Mishnah to define why the extra laws, to create a hedge around the law. And the idea was, if we could keep every Jew five steps back from actually transgressing of the law of God, then he would bless our nation, Messiah would come, the kingdom would be ushered in. And so we have to add these laws, extra laws, to keep anyone from actually breaking the law of God. Now that is a bogus system. And Jesus meant to, to expose that, to highlight it, to teach us not to approach following him that way. Beware the leaven of the scribes and the Pharisees, he says. But it's bogus because sin resides in the heart, right? Thou shalt not covet. <laughs> how, how many steps are you going to add to avoid coveting in your heart, right? It's going to be there. It's at its root. You can't smear it over with external self-righteousness. So the old, I think, represents this type of approach that Judaism had to law-keeping for righteousness in order to please God. What then is the new? Several overlapping things. And if you're taking notes, I think you should write these down. Jesus brings the new, and it represents a new movement, sort of some informal terms, a new movement, a new offer, a new approach to God. Through him, a new order of things, a new way, a new movement, offer, approach to God, a new order of things, a new way. But more specifically, he brings a new message, namely the gospel, right? A new message. The gospel, Paul describes as, it has now been revealed, Ephesians 3, 5 and 2 Timothy 1, 9. He brings a new message, the gospel, that Sinners can be forgiven through faith in him based on a new work. His own work on the cross to atone for sinners, like Matthew and company at this feast, like you and me this morning. And this new work will usher in a new covenant that Jeremiah describes in Jeremiah 31. He says, God says, behold, the days are coming. I will make a new covenant, not like the covenant I made with their fathers, on the day I brought them out of Egypt, not like the covenant at Sinai. And Jesus says in Luke 22:20 20, that this covenant is now inaugurated through his blood. And a new covenant means a new era, a new era, marked by inclusion of all believers into the church from both Jew and Gentile, anyone who would believe down through this era, this age. And then also a new people of God, a new people of God like Matthew and company, like all those who believed in the early church, like those from among the Gentiles who believed in the early church. In Ephesians 2.12, Paul writing to predominantly Gentile church in Ephesus says, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise before you heard the gospel, while... Uh, stuck in idolatry as a Gentile. He says, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, he says, in Christ, this is the new, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace who has made both us one. So Jews and Gentiles, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. There was a dividing wall between Jew and Gentile in the Old Covenant. Defined by ethnicity, defined by the law of God. Jesus broke this down in the new by dividing the wall of hostility, by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, that is, the church. And Jesus ushers this new in. It's not compatible with the old. This is the same truth conveyed in the second parable. Notice the second one now, verse 37. And he says, no one. Now notice in these three parables, verses 36, 39, there are three no ones. Beginning of verse 36, no one tears. And then again, verse 37, no one puts. And verse 39, no one after drinking old, right? 
It tells us, the, tells us that these are or should be self-evident truths. Moving on, verse 36. He also said a parable, no one tears a piece. I'm sorry, verse 37. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins and will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. Same truth. Old and new are not compatible. Wineskins at that time were made from hides, goat hides, and prepared for keeping wine. They would stretch when they were new, but as you may know, old skins like leather, an old saddle, or an old baseball glove, unused for some time, the leather becomes dried out and brittle. And wine was precious commodity in Israel, storing it carried its value. And when new wine is bottled, or in this case, vesseled, it would continue to ferment. Some of you may have uh, made homemade cider before, and usually if it's your first time doing it, you don't realize that it will naturally ferment and continue to ferment. So if you put it in a, a gallon of milk, it explodes. <laughs> Got a call from my wife one morning about that back in New York. Nowadays, they stop that process with cooler temperatures or chemicals, the fermenting process of wine. But then it would stop when basically the sugar content was eaten up by the yeast and it wouldn't ferment anymore. As it fermented, it would give off carbon dioxide and if it was in anything, it would expand. That, that added gas has to be released. If this happens in old wineskins, they won't expand because they're old and brittle and so they will crack and burst. And the result is that you can't use this wineskin, this old wineskin anymore for old aged wine, right? For wine that has stopped the fermenting process. And also you waste the new wine. It will be a lose-lose situation all around. Same thing with the, the old garment and the new garment. You'll lose both. You'll lose your vessel and you'll lose your new batch of wine. And in those days, both a vessel for wine and the wine itself came with a lot of hard work, right? It wasn't easy to replace. And this is another given. That's not going to work. People know that. But he says, verse 38, in, po in the positive, new wine must be put in fresh wineskins. And that new wine is all that he brings, right? His message, his work, the new covenant, and the wineskins here, I think, represent the new people of God. They are not old and hardened with pharisaical self-righteousness, who would have to be sort of reworked and re-stretched and at the pressure of that maybe break to accommodate in, in trying to accommodate his teaching. Those sitting with him there in this feast, in this house, they are new and they are ready. They are ready to come to Messiah in repentance. They are ready to embrace his welcome of them and his forgiveness for them. And one of the most exciting things for me to see in the church today is new young believers who are on fire for Christ, right? We have that phrase, they're on fire for Christ. They're in love with Christ. They're learning, they're devouring the word of God. They're taking all kinds of risks to share their faith. They're jumping into things that they're pro probably not ready for. These are new wineskins, and it's so exciting to see. And I think it's honoring, honoring to God, right? It says so much. This is Matthew in this scene. A new wineskin. I'm throwing a feast. Everybody come. You got to meet him. You got to meet him. On the, on the flip side, one of the most discouraging things in the church is to see a believer who has walked with the Lord for a long time or believed for a long time, and yet is stale, stiff, inflexible, stuck in old ways and patterns. Probably the, even the more exciting thing, though, is to see someone who has walked with the Lord for that long and still vibrant and fresh and taking risks and believing and learning and growing. We can sort of let this sort of old meld with the new in our Christian living. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work. What does it mean for my life to have new wine in a new wineskin for the duration of my Christian life? That's a good question. What does it look like if 
these things kind of get blended together. Well, I think one of the ways is that we just start living practically like legalists, right? We just start living practically like the measure of my righteousness is this list of do's and don'ts, and that's it. When really the tokens of actual holiness and righteousness and growth are things like love, right? L Lord, help me to love better. When you get stuck in sort of cultural legalism in the church, that's not really a whole lot of what's discussed and aimed for. Lord, help me to love better. Or Lord, help me to depend on you more. Or Lord, increase the intensity of my worship. Or Lord, help me to seek your face more. Those are instinctive in that new love, that sort of honeymoon time as a new believer in Christ. But we can't allow ourselves sort of as a church and in our own personal walk to sort of drift into this very attainable list of do's and don'ts and legalism. In that sense, we're melding two different ways, right? Two different ways of living. And Jesus warned us against that. Beware the leaven of the scribes and Pharisees. This morning, it might be that we need a little massaging of our wineskin, some accommodating to new wine. There's an excitement here to Christ categorizing his ministry in this way. That this is new, and it's not going to be compatible with the old. I am moving forward. I am moving forward. And there is to be this kind of forward tilt, I think, to living the Christian life in a, in a vibrant and healthy church, a forward tilt to obeying the Great Commission, of forgetting what lies behind, of reaching forward to what's ahead, praying for new things to happen, for God to be at work in our midst. And I think that's what we need to be about to be in this sort of new mode of following Christ. So the first truth here is new is incompatible with the old. And the last truth here is distinct. Jesus ends here and changes the dynamic of what he's saying. Again, another parable, another metaphor, but changes the angle on, uh, on what he's talking about. Verse 39. The second truth is that the old will in fact reject the new. The old, we don't have to worry about the new sort of working to fix the old because after all, they, they don't want it. They're not going to want it. And the metaphor, the parable is old taste for old wine. Verse 39, and no one after drinking old wine desires new for he says, the old is good. The old is good. <clears throat> this is an accustomed taste. And we see this tenor played out in the Gospels and the early church. We see this at work in Nicodemus, right? Nicodemus takes the three years of Christ's ministry to finally uh, at least be public about his faith. He may have come to faith earlier than that, right? But he is entrenched in this pharisaical system, and he doesn't turn as quickly as the other apostles do. He doesn't turn as quickly as Matthew does, or the woman in Luke 7 who is a sinner. It takes time. It's, it's, it's hard for him to accommodate what Jesus says. We see this later in the church even. Turn with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. This is at the end of Paul's second missionary journey. It says, from there they sailed to, they're coming back now. And it says, when they had arrived there and gathered the church together at Antioch, they began to report all things that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles and they spent a long time with the disciples. Now, this was a rejoicing occasion. But notice verse 15, some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And we talked extensively about this during our time in the book of Galatians. And this creates a debate when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them. The brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some of the others uh, should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. And so they go. This comes up in Galatians 2 as well. If you turn over there. <clears throat> Galatians 2.11, But when Cephas, Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned 
for prior to the coming of certain men from James, these are the Judaizing, sort of Pharisaic Christians, he used to eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision, right? Those group of Jewish Pharisaical Christians who now come up to Antioch and they mess with the church and they separate the church in fellowship. Peter goes along with them. Notice verse 13, the rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. This is not an issue of Gentile versus Jew. This is an issue of Jewish Christian versus Jewish Christian of the Pharisaic type. So they separate here, which had not been the, the normal custom because of their common ground in Christ. Paul says, but when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, Peter, in the presence of all, if you being a Jew live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel Gentiles to live like Jews? We are Jews by nature, not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. What's happening here? These Christians from a Pharisaic background, they are having a hard time, the hardest time of anybody, accommodating to the new wine of Christ's teaching. They are not living consistently with the implications of the gospel. And even Peter and Barnabas, who had some exposure to Pharisaical Judaism, are carried away with it and drawn back into it. What is it? They have a taste for the old. They have an accustomed taste for the old, and they say, the old is good, or in some translations, the old is, is better. We don't need this new thing. Legalism can be hard to overcome if you've experienced that in the church. And many churches are like that. Many churches are like that. Legalism could make us think that my right standing before God fluctuates based on my performance rather than being overwhelmed by the great truths of the gospel, that God does the saving, that your righteousness is in fact a righteousness from outside of yourself imputed to you. It's the righteousness of Christ that cannot be improved upon. Yeah, we, can, we can be disobedient. We can... We can uh, uh, mess with our, our, our assurance and how we feel in our confidence and our relationship with God when we sin. Yes, that happens for sure. But the rock-solid truth of the gospel is that if you have turned from your sin and believed in Christ, you are indeed forgiven. You are indeed a son. When, when your son or your daughter does something stupid and even they do something drastic and sin against you, do you say, okay, forget it? Until you sort of get right, make this right, you are no longer my child. It doesn't happen. And it doesn't happen with the believer either. But legalism gets ingrained. We get a taste for it. We feel confident in ourselves when we're successful at it. And then we feel condemned when we fail at it. It's not, it's not the new wine that Jesus came to bring. A works mindset, a self-earned righteousness... That's not, that's not the gospel. That's not for the Christian. Matthew, Matthew would have been certain of that, right? You have no grounds for being an apostle except the grace of God. And that's the same for every person who believes. This call here, this example here, these words of Christ here describe the new way of following Jesus. This is a new era, and it's based on his new work of atonement. Prior to this, atonement only happened at the temple only temporarily. But when Christ died on the cross, he inaugurated this new way for full atonement, full reconciliation before God for the believer. It comes also with a new mission, right? The Great Commission is what we're to be about and a new set of values for living in Christ's teaching. The question this morning is, are you living out this new life in Christ or in some way have drifted into merging it with the old. Maybe this morning you need to get back to the newness and freshness of 
being a follower of Christ, of taking on the mantle of sharing his message and his mission, the excitement that he had in this instance and then for those early disciples and maybe for you when you became a new Christian, is that freshness still there? Are you flexible and are you being expanded with a knowledge of God and new steps of faith and new growth in Christ? When was the last time you were brokenhearted before him to have a heart full of love for him and others as you did at the first? Keith Green, not the most astute theologian out there, but certainly someone who lived to the full for Christ after his conversion. He writes a song, My Eyes Are Dry. He says, my eyes are dry, my faith is old, my heart is hard, my prayers are cold. And I know how I ought to be, alive to you and dead to me. I've been at, I, I've been at times in my life where I've, I've sung this song and I've needed to sing this song because my heart has grown cold, I'm sorry, hard, and my prayers are cold. I don't have much hope. My days are full, filled with despair and discouragement and perplexion and confusion and not with a fresh love and hope and excitement for Christ. He goes on, but what can be done for an old heart like mine? Soften it up with oil and wine. The oil is you, your spirit of love. Please wash me anew with the wine of your blood. Let's pray that together this morning as a church. Let's be, let's be filled with the newness of Christ. Amen? Amen. Lord, thank you for your word. And I pray that you would indeed do this very work to soften our hearts with your spirit and to cleanse our hearts with the wine of your blood. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy to us that is new every morning. By your spirit, fill each one of us, Lord, and use us for your kingdom purposes here in Claremont and beyond. We thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.